So what's the evidence for the theory? Well, one is the fossil record. The fossil record will always have gaps because most organisms leave, leave no traces of their having been here. But there have been some dramatic examples in the last few years of supposed gaps in the fossil record that are actually being filled. Here is one uh, Tiktaalik, uh, this remarkable animal that seems to be partly land and partly aquatic, uh, representing uh, an animal that has four limbs that are partly like fins and partly like something that could move on land. A very interesting uh, observation. But I would say, actually, that most of the more recent evidence supporting Darwin's theory of evolution comes from the study of DNA. If Darwin, back uh, 150 years ago, had tried to imagine uh, what kind of proof might come along for his theory, he might have thought of a time machine, because that would be helpful. Uh, I don't know whether he would have thought of DNA, because nobody had a clue what that stuff was that controlled heredity. But this, in fact, turns out to be uh, a beautifully digital demonstration of the way in which evolution occurs, namely by gradual change, mutations in DNA, uh, acted upon by natural selection over very, very long periods of time. So if you take the DNA, not just of ourselves, but of lots of other organisms, and you determine its sequence, and we've done this now for more than three dozen uh, vertebrates, and you place them in order, basically, uh, depending upon the similarities of their DNA sequences, this is what you get. Uh, this is a tree uh, that uh, represents uh, those similarities. And what do you know? It matches extremely well with the tree that has been previously put together based upon anatomic similarities on the one hand and the fossil record on the other. So there's a remarkable consistency here. Now, those who are not comfortable with evolution as the answer, who would rather see that this is a result of multiple acts of special creation by God, who basically used the same motifs uh, for these various organisms with minor changes, would say, and I think could accurately say, that that would still give you this same pattern. This does not demonstrate absolutely without a shadow of a doubt that there is a common ancestor down here. But other things that we've learned uh, basically make that alternative you know, almost impossible to support. And so let me point out that this applies not just to other organisms, but to ourselves. And a particularly compelling example comes from all places, human chromosome 2. And it comes from looking at human chromosome 2 compared to our closest relative, the chimpanzee, whose genome sequence we also have now at a fairly high level of accuracy. If you look at the human chromosomes under the microscope and compare them to the chimpanzee, they look very similar. This is a a drawing of what they would look like. The human has 22 of the so-called autosomes and then the sex chromosomes X and Y. The chimpanzee has chromosomes that look very much the same in terms of size and banding pattern with one exception, which is over here, where human chromosome 2 does not seem to have a similar chromosome in the chimp or, in fact, in the gorilla. But if you look closely at the banding pattern, and people have stared at that uh, for uh, many decades, it looks as if perhaps if you put those two together, sort of head to head, you might end up with that. Well, now that we have the sequence, we can actually examine that hypothesis. And I need to tell you something important about chromosomes. Chromosomes have at their very tips, the so-called telomeres of all of these, a special DNA sequence that only happens at the telomeric tips. Now, if, in fact, there had been a recent fusion of two chromosomes to make one, you might expect there would be a footprint of that, namely the appearance of those telomeric sequences in the middle of a chromosome where they don't belong. Well, what do you know? When you look carefully at human chromosome 2, you discover sequences here indicated by these colored balls, which do, in fact, represent telomeric sequences and in fact, you can see that the specific form of those is exactly what is traveling in the chimpanzee in those two smaller chromosomes. So we now have evidence not just from indirect observation of banding patterns, but from specific DNA sequences that make it inescapable in the view of those who've looked at this data carefully, that in fact there was an ancient fusion, probably sometime in the neighborhood of four million years ago, which brought together those two chromosomes, leaving the evidence of their fusion point uh, in these specific DNA sequences, which we find there and find in nowhere else in the human genome. They shouldn't be there. They will probably, over the next oh, five or six million years, if we're lucky enough to be around, uh, gradually uh, disappear because they were not being so subject to any particular selection. They're not performing any function. But they're there now as evidence of this step.
That makes it very difficult to postulate that humans and chimps are not descended from a common ancestor. The common ancestor presumably had this version, since gorillas also have that version. There are other uh, examples. Uh, one other quick one is the existence of pseudogenes. Uh, pseudogenes are, in fact, uh, genes that once apparently had a function but have acquired a number of lethal flaws that render them no longer functioning. Now, when you look around our genome or that of a mouse or a dog or a cat or a cow, you will find quite a lot of these. And a particularly interesting circumstance, of course, is when you find the human has a gene that was once active in other species. And here's a circumstance uh, that is uh, particularly interesting. If you look across human, chimp, and dog as three possible uh, organisms whose sequence we have in front of us, and if you find the order of three genes as A, B, and C, you will often find that order is preserved in other organisms in the mammalian lineage. That in itself suggests a common ancestor, but doesn't prove it. But occasionally, you'll find a circumstance where the human gene is a pseudogene. It's sustained a knockout blow. It's no longer functioning. It has a lethal flaw. But the chimp and the dog will still have that gene functioning. Now, that is a great puzzle unless you're going to postulate a common ancestor. If God, in fact, had created the human genome independently as an act of special creation, why would God have placed in this very position a non-functioning gene? So for both this case and the chromosome 2 case, I think it becomes extremely difficult to avoid the conclusion that we are descended from a common ancestor as are other living things. The alternative requires you to place God in the position of being a bit of a charlatan, of actually having put information into the genome to purposefully mislead us into drawing a conclusion that's not in fact correct. And that does not sound like the God that I worship. <laughs>